welcome to our midweek Bible study. Uh, certainly an honor and privilege to be able to share with you the Word of God. Uh, I am glad that God has given you another day to be able to uh, study His Word, to be able to uh, give Him glory, and to be thankful for who God is. I want to, as a reminder, give you our prayer list. Uh, Sister uh, Agnes Williams uh, is in need of prayer for her son, Johnny. Johnny, uh, I don't know if you are aware, but Johnny has been admitted into the hospital. He is in ICU in the hospital due to respiratory problems. So uh, pray for Sister Agnes Williams, pray for her son, Johnny Williams, and pray for her daughter, Stacy, uh, who is also asking for prayer. I would ask that you pray for Sister Mildred Miles as she has requested uh, further prayer concerning her health. Continue to pray for Brother Henry Harris, who is in the hospital, Sister Katrina Hall, Brother Irvin Thomas. Continue to pray for Sister Pat Ball as she uh, gets ready to travel to see her sister uh, in Tennessee. So uh, continue to pray for uh, Sister Ball and for traveling grace. Continue to pray for all the others that are on our prayer list and continue prayer lists that uh, may not have called, but uh, they stand in need of prayer. So we would ask that you uh, uh, those of you who have prayer requests or are in need of prayer, please call in so that we would know uh, what your prayer request is and that we can make it known so the prayers of the saints will go up on your behalf. Now, I want to, I want to uh, connect the dots and finish a particular study that I thought would be encouraging to you um, that we started uh, a few days ago uh, in a previous Bible study, and prayerfully we'll get back to our study on the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. But I wanted to share with you, as you know, we talked about the faithfulness of God and how encouraging and, uh, and, and refreshing it is to know that God is faithful to his people. But I want to, uh, before we go into our study to continue it, I want us to, uh, for definition's sake, uh, write down what it is we are understanding about God's faithfulness. We're looking at an attribute of God, a characteristic of God, that which is in God's nature, which makes him who he is. So for definition, Faithfulness is a characteristic or an attribute of God that depicts God's perfect loyalty and consistency on being true to his name, character, and word. Faithfulness is that attribute of God that depicts his perfect loyalty and consistency on being true to his name, his character, and his word. Another definition of the faithfulness of God would be that characteristic that guarantees that God will never be or act inconsistent with himself. It is that characteristic, or you can even say that attribute, that guarantees that God will never be or act inconsistently or inconsistent with himself. <laughs> Which means God, it is impossible for God to not be faithful. He can never, because of who he is, because he is absolute in all that he is, God can never be or act inconsistent with who he is, and that is, he is faithful. So you will never find a situation, you will never find the circumstance that you're in, you will never find yourself being in a place operating by faith with God, in, and then find out that God is inconsistent with who he is. 
you'll never find it. You will never ever experience that God is inconsistent with being faithful. Watch this, to himself and to his people. Now we looked at that uh, in Numbers 23 and verse 19. We saw that God makes good on everything he has spoken and promised. How is that so? Because God can never act inconsistent with who he is. He cannot, you will not find a flaw in God's faithfulness. Well, we also saw in Exodus 12 and verse 41 that God never forgets what he promised. Now, that's a, that's a passage that speaks of Israel being in bondage for 430 years. And after the 430 years, God remembers, not that he forgot, but remembering signified that God is now ready to act on what he had already promised. He foretold that Israel, his people, would be in Egyptian bondage for 400 years. Now that it has come to pass and the, and the 430 years are up, by God's timetable, God now is going to act. He calls Moses over to lead his people because the 400 years have passed. And God, because of his faithfulness, 400 plus years later, God says, now let's move my people. What is the point? God is never inconsistent with who he is and uh, what he has set out to accomplish for his people. He will not be found unfaithful, inconsistent with who he is, with what he promised, and to his word. My dear friends, God is faithful. He is perfectly loyal. He's perfectly consistent. So God doesn't waver. God doesn't falter. God in shaky in what he says and what he does. God's character, this attribute is one that you and that we as children of God can be faithful to. We can put faith, trust, and, uh, and our hope in a faithful God. Now, the other thing you need to bear in mind, we looked at, uh, we, we noted that it is one thing to accept the faithfulness of God, but it's something entirely altogether different to act on the faithfulness of God. One thing to say, you believe God is faithful, but it is something else entirely different, my dear friends, for you to act on the faithfulness of God. Now, we know that God is faithful. We believe God is faithful, that is. But now, what are you going to do? How is that faith, your faith, going to be demonstrated toward God? You're going to act, walk, and live by faith that is based on the foundation of God's own faithfulness. So when you say, when we use the terminology, uh, I'm going to step out on faith, you aren't, well, whose faith are you stepping out on? Because when you step out, you're stepping out by faith and with faith, but you're stepping on the faithfulness of God. So when we talk about stepping out on faith, just make sure you are clearly aware of whose faith you're going to step out on. Make sure you aren't stepping out on your own faith. Make sure you aren't stepping out on someone else's faith. Make sure you aren't stepping out on your mother or your father's faith or your brother or sibling's faith. You've got to make sure that whatever I do, my response to God is that I am by faith going to act, live, and move based on the foundation of his own faithful character. Well, to, to prove that, uh, or let's look at Isaiah chapter uh, 50. In Isaiah chapter 50, uh, Isaiah 50 and verse 8. Now, you know that I, uh, the Israelites are in bondage. 
and notice what takes place in I, or what Isaiah would say in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 8. Now watch the language. He who vindicates me, he's near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Now watch Isaiah say. Watch what he says. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, he will all, uh, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him, watch what Isaiah says, let him trust in the name of the Lord and, re here's another key word, rely on his God. How is it he can trust in a God and rely on God? Because God is faithful. God cannot go back to, uh, to uh, against, should I say, who he is and what he is. He is faithful. He is loyal. He is consistent. And Isaiah, and Isaiah says, you need to trust him and you need to rely on him because he is faithful. So it's one thing to say, I accept the faithfulness of God. I believe in the faithfulness of God. Oh, but church, my question to you would be, are you acting on the faithfulness of God? Well, uh, you know uh, what takes place. Second Peter chapter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 13 Paul told, P, uh, Tim, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Paul tells Timothy this. He says, listen, our unbelief shall not nullify the faith of God, or uh, it cannot negate God's faithfulness. Just because you don't believe, just because you have no faith in God, doesn't negate or it doesn't stop or thwart. God's own faithfulness. He will continue to be faithful even if his own people cease to be faithful to him. Even if they choose not to believe in him, God will remain faithful. Church, that's a blessing and that is assuring and refreshing when you understand God isn't going to change. Just like God's judgment, just like God's grace, just like God's vindication, just like God's redemption, just like God's forgiving us, none of that changes with God. Well, just know that his faithfulness will not either. Yeah, so he's faithful. And simply because a person doesn't believe, because you have skeptics, even amongst God's people, that doesn't change, that God will be, or doesn't eliminate God being faithful to his people. Now, uh, that means our response should be one of faith toward God. That is, our response should be seen in our own steadfast commitment, which reflects God's faithfulness. So, church, what does that mean for us? That if God is faithful to us, and he is, then our response should be one of faithfulness. And that faithfulness ought to respect or ought to reflect the one you are connected to. The one who is faithful to you, it ought to now be reflected in your own life. That's why I just told you, you've got to act on the faithfulness of God. Just believing in God being faithful isn't enough. You now have to act. You've got to move. You've got to operate in this world on God's faithfulness. And it ought to reflect how faithful he is to you. That should be our response, church. Look at, look at 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Look, look at 1 Peter chapter 4. And 1 Peter chapter 4 Verse, uh, verse 13, verse 13 says, But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. 
so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. Now, Peter is telling them, I know you're going through hardship. I know you are suffering. I know you're dealing with some trials and some, some very real tribulations. I understand that. He says, but make sure in your suffering, watch what he instructs them to do. Make sure that in your suffering, verse 19 says, therefore those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust your soul. To who? To a faithful creator in doing what's right. Uh -huh. So he says to them, in your suffering, do the right thing. In your suffering, make sure it isn't as a meddler. Make sure it isn't as a murderer. Make sure it isn't as someone who causes trouble. He says, you're going to suffer, but there's a right way to suffer. And the right way to suffer would be to entrust your soul to a faithful creator. Give it all to God. Say, God, even with my life, if I face death, like these Christians would face the death, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the death hand and command of Nero, he would say to us today, well, face life and its adversity and its uncertainty by entrusting your soul to a faithful creator. What is the point? Our response should be that we are entrusting ourselves to God no matter what the situation, in difficult times and in suffering. Well, another response should be, our response should be an unwavering faithfulness to God. Come, come back to the Old Testament with me and let's look at Joshua. Let's look at, uh, uh, actually, let's come back. We'll come back to Joshua, but let's come, let's go to uh, Deuteronomy. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5 and notice verse 32. So you shall obey to do as uh, well, let me read that again. So you shall observe to do just as the Lord your God has commanded. In other words, don't deviate. Do exactly what God has commanded. That's our problem today for many of us. The reason we keep going through the same things oftentimes, the reason we keep experiencing the same hardship that we bring on ourselves is because we don't do what the Lord tells us to do. If sometimes we just got in our mind and made up in our mind, we're going to do exactly as God commands us to do. We're going to live as God has commanded us to do. We're going to treat others as God has commanded us to do. We're going to speak as God has commanded us to do. We're going to think as God has commanded us to do. Life for some of us, many of us, would be quite different. What? He doesn't stop there. He says, you shall observe to do just as the Lord your God has commanded you, and you shall not turn. Watch this. You shall not turn aside to the right or the left. In other words, stay focused. You shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess. So what is he expecting them to do? Have an unwavering faithfulness to God, an unwavering faithfulness to his word, and an unwavering faithfulness in your lifestyle. Watch this. Observe, do not turn, and then walk. Look at the three things he tells us. It's right in the text. You shall observe, observe his word, do all that the Lord has commanded. And then secondly, when you get the word in you, don't turn. He says don't turn from the, to the right and don't turn to the left. Stay focused. 
And then last, he says, and then walk. Because when you get your focus, first when you get your directives, when you get the plan and the blueprint from God, now you know which direction you need to go. Once you get the direction in which you need to go, he says the next thing you need to do is act on it. Start walking in the direction that God has carved out for you. Oh, church, life would be, young people, life would be a lot better off for you if you just observe, if you do not turn, and if you walk the way God wants you to walk. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. Notice what Joshua would say. Notice at verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him with, its, with sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose yourselves today whom you would serve whether the gods uh, which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He says to them, now listen, you, you need to make a choice. You need to, you need to make sure you're going to either serve God or you're going to serve your, yourself or these idol gods. Now you need to make a decision. But here's what my decision is, and it isn't based on you. Remember I just told you, we got to walk by faith and with faith, but on the faithfulness of God. You know why? Because mama's faith can't get you to heaven. Daddy's faith can't get you to heaven. Your sibling's faith can't get you to heaven. As a matter of fact, putting faith on some other Christian can't make you right with God. You've got to walk in the direction God wants you to walk and you've got to do all that the Lord has commanded you to do and no matter what other people say about it you've got to take the position Joshua would take as for me I don't know what you want to do I don't know I don't know what you have in mind I don't know what you're conjuring up uh, for your own family but one thing I will do with my family we're going to serve the Lord look at Joshua he says I've got an unwavering faith. Yeah, I, I'm committed to this thing. I bought into it. So it's, it has to be unwavering. And then our faith needs to be focused, committed with a prioritized life. Look at Luke chapter 9, if you will. Come with me to Luke chapter 9. Let's begin at uh, verse number uh, 57. In Luke chapter 9, verse 57, the Bible says, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. He said to another, Jesus says to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Jesus said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But just as just that, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Look at the priority. Look at the focus. Look at the commitment that's involved in, in, in being a faithful to God. He says, listen, I know that you have to bury your loved one. I understand that. But he says, what's more important? Because your loved one is already dead. They've already passed on. What are you going to do? What are you going to proclaim in my name? What is it? What, what's required? Focus. Right? What's required? Commitment. And a prioritized life. Oftentimes we don't do what God has uh, commanded us. We don't walk in the ways of God. We don't, we, don't, we don't live out uh, our kingdom responsibilities, and here's why. Because our lives are not prioritized for kingdom business. We aren't committed to kingdom business, and we aren't focused on kingdom business. But Jesus said, no, if you're going to do what I, if you're going to follow me, uh, then you've got to be focused, committed, and, and priority. priority. I 
am priority. I must be priority in your life. He says, uh, let the bed, the dead bury the dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Didn't I tell you you had to get your focus? When you are focused, you don't look back. When you are focused, you aren't turning to the left or the right. When you are focused, you are focused on the proper goal. Oh, church, you've got to, you've got to be focused. You've got to be committed. You have to have your life prioritized for the kingdom of God. Well, we must be faithful in prayer. You know, in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, Paul would tell the church there to make sure that you pray without ceasing. Now, to pray without ceasing, to make sure you in your daily life, throughout the week, throughout the year, you incorporate persistent prayer in your life. Well, that, that's faithfulness. That requires faithfulness. And then when you read Romans 12 and verse 12, Paul would tell the church there, make sure you are devoted to prayer. Not only to one another, but be devoted in your prayer life. Be committed in your prayer life. So we need to have not only a prioritized life, be focused and committed, but we also need to be faithful in our prayer life. Why? Because it, it, it reflects how faithful God is. You aren't going to pray faithfully to a God you don't believe is faithful to you. So if God is faithful to me, praise be the name of Jesus, I'm going to call out to him. Because I know I can call out on to him. I know I can count on him. And guess what it does? It, it connects. It's reciprocal. A faithful God will induce faithful prayer from me. From us. As children of God. How in the world can we say we're Christians? We believe in God. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love both of them. But we don't even pray to him. We aren't faithful to him. He says, no, you got to have a faithful prayer life. And then we must remember, get this church, we must remember that God will never cease to be what he is and who he is. Nothing, and I love this part, nothing can force God to act otherwise than faithfully to himself and to his people. <laughs> here's, here's no situation and no person. I don't care how powerful they may claim to be or be. No person or no situation that his children are in can influence God to stop being faithful to you. Nothing. Name the situation. Cancer doesn't stop God from being faithful to his people. Financial hardship doesn't stop God from being faithful to his people. Huh? Uh, uh, the mistreatment from the world, oh no, that doesn't stop God from being faithful. Mistreatment from your own family, it doesn't stop God from being faithful to you. Nothing or no one can stop God from being faithful to who he is, what he is, and to his people. What a blessing. Nothing can influence God to act unfaithfully. You know why? Because there's no one greater than the greatest. There's no one higher than the highest. And there's no one mightier than the mightiest. That's all God. What a blessing. And then remember, God watches the faithful. Psalm chapter 97 verse 10. Psalm chapter 37 verse 28. And Psalms chapter 31, verse 23. And then remember, God rewards faithfulness. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 20. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42 through 47. And then let's look lastly at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Oh, it's a familiar passage. 2 Timothy chapter 4.
2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says in verse 5, But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Notice what Paul tells Timothy. He says, as a young preacher, you're going to endure hardship, but I want you to do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. For I, Paul, am already being poured out as a drink offering. I may, me, I may face death while I'm in prison and while I'm writing this letter to you, but I want you to know that I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. But here's what I want you to keep in mind, Timothy. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, and I have kept, I've guarded, safeguarded what God has entrusted to me. I've kept the faith. And in the future there is laid up for me, here's a reward, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall award me in that day, and not to me only, but all those who love his appearing. What, what are we to remember? That God watches over the faithful and God rewards faithfulness. Church, I am so glad that we have a faithful God. That a God, a God who will not go back on being who he is. He can't be. He can't be anything other than who he is. Listen, it's like being God is holy. God can't. He can't be any holier than what he already is, neither can he be less holier than what he already is. It, do you not know, in order for God to change, God would have to go from better to worse, worse to better, or he would have to change into a whole complete being other than what he is now. God is the ultimate. He is the epitome. He is, he is all of that concerning his character and who he is. And I am thankful, and you should be too, that he is faithful. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you are faithful. We are thankful that you can, that you, you it is impossible for you to cease being who you are. We are thankful, Father, that you are consistent and loyal to us in spite of the fact that we are not loyal to you all the time. Father, we ask that you have mercy on us, that you, Father, be patient with us, and that we will begin to act on your faithfulness. Father, we pray and ask that you bless those on our prayer list with healing. Father, uh, the caretakers of all those on our sick list, that you give them the strength that they need, the will and uh, the mindset that they need. Father, we we realize and sometimes take for granted that when you have to take care of a loved one, it, it expends all of your energy, Father, mentally and physically. So we ask that you strengthen them and bless them in this regard. Father, keep all of us in the hollow of your hands. Help us to persevere through it all. It's in Jesus' name we pray.